Hi, it's Monday, it's three o'clock. Welcome to Together Unlocked. I'm Jude Gosling, also known as the artist Jude 90. I'm the artistic director of Together 2012 that's bringing you this live stream today. Also with me in my East London studio is our chair, the artist Julie Newman. We'll come back to us for a bit of audio description in a moment. But first, over to the other half of our very long virtual sofa in the West Midlands. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the week. I am Robin Sergener, um, business director at Together 2012 and also an artist known as Angry Fish. I'll go on to, to give you a little bit of description. Uh, my hair has decided um, to become gravitationally challenged or is it just challenging gravity, whichever way you want to do it is suddenly decided that upwards is better than down and I think it's just it's I don't know how, what I'm going to do yet. I might have to come around and borrow those clippers. So after all that complete guff, I have white hair that is now too long. Uh, glasses, I'm shaved-ish. Uh, I'm wearing a big, thick, burgundy, mostly burgundy collared hooded sweatshirt um, with a black stripe across the chest and the upper arms. I'm wearing that because it's pouring with rain and freezing in Birmingham, despite it being August. Hi, I'm Josh Sergener. I'm uh, also one of the hosts of Together TV and a uh, doctoral research student um, when not in lockdown, or when in lockdown, I just don't do as much work as I should do. Um, and I have uh, slightly wayward blonde hair, uh, no glasses, and I have a, I'm wearing a black um, kind of turtleneck jumper uh, with two gray drawstrings. Uh, hanging in the middle. So back to East London, I have a self-inflicted corona crop thanks to the assistance dog already having a pair of clippers. I've got black framed glasses, black wrist braces, silver jewellery and a white t-shirt that says magic hour on it. This is our magic hour. It's the last week we will officially be shielding. So later in the week, I think Friday, we will be having a last day of shielding party. Do send us your shielding stories. Friday is also the day when we dress up to go out to stay in. You may indeed dress up to go out, ready to go out, but let's have your shielding end looks, your shielding fashion, your end of shielding fashion, and send us your photos and films for Friday. So, Julie, what do you look like? A bit confused <laughs> um, <laughs> because, Robin, it's the 27th of July. It's not August yet. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that just says how cold it is. My brain can't tell. I had to check there for a minute because I was thinking, oh, my goodness. Oh, I know why. It's because I was looking at the calendar uh, for something next week and I've got August on my brain. Well, I think August is, is going to be welcome for, for all, to all of us for, for various <laughs> reasons. Um, I have uh, silver and gold hair. I have dark rimmed glasses. I have a polo shirt, which is dark blue with... Uh, Little, little anchors on it, um, which I think is very topical for today for me. And um, and it's raining here, but it's still meltingly really hot, hot, which is why we've got tops on. Behind us, you can see part of the Together 2012 graffiti banner that has pictures or symbols on it, I should say, of all the activities we run through the year. So we're what they describe as a combined arts organisation we do carnival art, we do street art, we do poetry, literature, spoken word, visual arts, crafts, film, photography, drama, and probably a few things that I've already forgotten. In more usual times, we have an outreach program in East Ham, which we deliver every weekday morning, free to any disabled person who can get there and anybody they want to bring with them. We call that our clubs program, and on a Monday, on the second Monday of each month, we have a photographers and filmmakers club, and on the fourth Monday, we have a film dance club. So Monday, we tend to talk about dance, film, or both, and today is going to be a film day, because last week, we had the wonderful Isolta Avila from Sign Dance Collective. We had a great dance-based film from Act Up Newham, our associate drama company, we're going to start off with a little bit of looking back over the weekend. We've got a, a new film 
from ACT UP Newham. And then I'm delighted to say we're going to be joined by Jamie Hale, who is going to tell us all about the online Zoom-based free writers retreat they're running later in the summer i believe in august so stroke september <laughs> all looking forward to august because on the first of august shielding officially well they don't say stopped they say paused and no doubt we'll come back to that but on a friday we do something for the weekend as we call it where we recommend things to do online and offline at home what did you get up to in the end? Did you manage to get through any of your programme of activity or did it all get taken over by life? Um, I managed to watch some of the, the sports stuff that I um, that I recommended. Um, I just kind of had it on in the background whilst I was doing other work um, and then kind of tuning in to the various kind of bits and pieces or rewinding if, that I, if I missed it. But I managed to watch um, kind of all of the London highlight stuff, which... Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed. I had, a, I had a great time. Well, well, and and we definitely agent carted, um, which is our family viewing, um, and and also we we binged watched series one of something called Hannah, um, which is absolutely excellent. It's very adult. I have to say that um, under advisement. Um, uh, and uh, but you I did watched. Yeah. Season two just come out, and I, I've already seen season one. So yeah. I made them like watch the whole thing, <laughs> so then we can watch season two together. Yeah, so so something else good. Um, and the rest of my weekend was sent set spent getting ready for going back to work tomorrow. The other work, swimming work. Swimming. Yeah. Because the pools opened on Saturday, didn't they? Um. Yeah. Officially, pools could open from Saturday. I don't know how many did open on Saturday. I mean, I do know that there are something like 1,300 facilities in the country still not opening and may not for financial and or other kind of re reasons that the shutdown has caused them maintenance and and and, and also the kind of fact that then it's going to be really difficult to be economically viable, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, with, with restricted numbers. Yes, I mean, swimming is important <coughs> for so many disabled people. Do you get any sense from your work with Swim England about whether the, if you like, the specific sessions are coming back, whether there's problems with things like the hoists that they used to use? Um, not in, not any specific things. I mean, I think there are, there is additional guidance on ensuring you know that any equipment that's used is wiped down after each use and that kind of thing um and and i think the biggest issue is going to be for um some you know disabled swimmers is going to be uh, that you can't access changing rooms so people are expected to go to swimming in dry stuff ready to get in and go home in wet stuff um so it's you know it's 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 not ideal it's not going to be ideal for anybody i mean and that's that, that you know and again for a lot of you know for example council run facilities they can't have their changing rooms open people simply aren't going to be able to use them well i think we've talked about this before and i imagine it's going to be a growing cause for concern over the next few months it's disabled people being left behind isn't it you know and um I forget who it was. It Mel, Melvin Ben who talked about disabled people not really going to Glastonbury anyway, which of course is completely untrue. Mm. There does seem to be a kind of assumption that, oh, we can put chairs all over Great Old Compton Street in London, Soho. The fact it stops wheelchair users from accessing the roads at all now doesn't seem to be an issue, and so on and so forth. So yeah, it will be very handy for to have any tips you can give us as the weeks go on about what you're picking up, about how easy it is for disabled people to access pools, and whether there's any tips. I mean, I know the smaller pools are going to find it more difficult, but I wonder sometimes that a smaller pool can actually be more flexible, because you're using a private pool when you go back aren't you we are but i i did look because i'm not going to be able to swim in that and i did look at our local um leisure services pool um and it, it is open with restricted hours and very restricted lane numbers um and only 18s and overs as well i mean because there's, there's absolutely no way they're going to be able to police 
family swimming, for example. Um, you know, you just can't do in, in terms of social distancing, I mean, anyway. <clears throat> so, yeah, so whilst it is open, it's only going to be for those who can go without kids um, and can fit in with the times. Um, I mean, it'll be emptier in some ways. From If you actually get in, it'll be quite nice because you'll have more space. <laughs> Yes, Jess Starnes, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago and is coming on again soon, said that she went to Hampton Court Palace at the weekend to celebrate her birthday and happy birthday, Jess. And it was practically deserted, which must have been incredibly surreal. Well, we watched films at the weekend when we weren't doing chores or indeed just resting and doing absolutely nothing, which was most of Saturday. And it's not untypical for us anyway because we've got very limited energy and you know ongoing lack of social care support but I did enjoy Maleficent 2 which I said I was going to watch and I did watch and there did seem to me to be the theme just as with the first one that you can't really trust people and this seems to be Disney seems to be getting really cynical I don't remember Disney being quite this cynical what's your take on it Josh? I'm trying to think Back, I, to, I mean, the early, early Disney stuff will, will leave because it's got its own problems. Um, I, you know, if you think back to kind of Tarzan, that's very kind of, you know, the, the jungle versus people. Um, I'm trying to think back. It's been a long time since I watched a lot of Disney films. Um, Emily's re-watching a lot of them at the moment. But I think that there's also a difference sometimes between films that are remakes of original stories and then Disney, Dis, Disney's like originals as well. So, I mean, you know, Hunchback and Notre Dame and Jungle Book are based on other stories. I mean, yeah, a lot of the Disney stuff is kind of Hans Christian Andersen and Brothers Grimm stories kind of yeah. retold in a much nicer way for children because <laughs> the originals are incredibly dark. I mean, I don't know about Dumbo and where the roots of Dumbo is, but we've spoken before about Alan Sutherland, who's a writer and poet who's written a lot about disability in film for the BFI. And I went to a wonderful talk he gave, and I'm hoping he'll come on to the show in the next few weeks, where he picked out Dumbo as one of the films that he would describe as a disability film, because it's all about physical difference and inclusion and integration. And I suppose, yes, you could say Maleficent, again, is looking at physical difference, you know, using those analogies. But physical difference doesn't get a very good reception. And at the end of the first film, it all looks like it's going to be very happy and inclusive. And by the beginning of the second film, all of that's fallen through. And at the end of the second film, you think, oh, it's going to be happy and inclusive after all. But you've got doubts because of what happened at the end of the first film. And... I don't remember Disney in the old days being quite that bleak. Julie? I'm just trying to think back. Um, no, it's only 15 years since I watched Dumbo, at least. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, I think, though, that if you, you think about a lot of those films, I mean, they, they also, a lot of them kind of uh, you, use the, you know, disability as the prop for evilness and harm you know right right through a lot of the films you know the 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 yes you you may well have someone who is on on the sort of the innocent victim end of it being being treated um improperly but actually also at the other the very end of it your captain hooks your Cruella de Vils, your, um and the list goes on really even in the cartoons of where the villain is 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 made more villainy by their physical attributes or their mental attributes yeah, and of course that goes right back to the roots of silent film, and of course beyond. You know, I won't go on about it now, but I, we've probably yeah. written things. And I know I went on a sort of voyage of exploration for a couple of years in the noughties when I wrote a book called Abnormal, and it was looking at all the different roots of our attitudes towards disability today, and they go back thousands of years and cover so many different fields. But still, I think. There were, there were films, and we'll get Alan in to talk about them, where 
absolutely they did buck the trend but i think in this case it's not so much physical differences being evil but just that you can't trust human beings if you're a fairy or a goblin or an elf or you've got any other kind of physical difference to the humans i don't know it just seems a little bit more complex and dark than it used to be but we might pick that one back up perhaps when um, we talk to Jamie. What do you think, Judy? Well, I think Josh is right. I mean, I think a lot of the original stories were very dark um, and I think they've been neutralised along the way. But I mean, even if you look at Peter Pan, um, you know, and Tinkerbell dying, <laughs> sort of like it all gets a bit alarming in places. <laughs> yeah, kind of every Disney character is an orphan and yeah. and things like that. It's like, you know, and yes, they all kind of end somewhat happily or in, in a cheery way. Um, and then, you know, if, if you get a sequel, you think I had to find some other kind of issue to, to create the story. But yeah, they always seem to be start out in some sort of tragedy. Um, it's just like, well, can I not just have a nice one? <laughs> I think none of the other cheery, can it? Yeah, I, I mean, interesting. Like, and then but... even the Lion King, there's no, yeah. there's no humans in it and he still ends up as an orphan. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but even new films, like completely different storyline. I don't think it's a Disney film, but um, there's a, a new it's a series of books about a boy called Artemis Fowl. Um, I don't know if you have heard of him, uh, um, um, but it, you know that one is very much about uh, it's it's all based in a in in the fairy realm, as it were, apart from when they have to encounter humans. Um, and it's about that kind of a really totally negative relationship between humans and the fairy world, even though there's lots of naughtiness going on in the fairy world as well. You know, the fundamental stumbling block is humans. Yes, I mean, I do wonder how much of it has got to do with the sort of growth of the environmental movement. I've got one word to say. <laughs> Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Yes, I was in two minds as to whether to subscribe to Disney instead of having a few summer days out, which we couldn't do in the first place because of exactly that. I've got two words for you, Judy. Black Beauty. That, that wasn't Disney. It's the worst film. I don't think I've ever seen that film. It's very, it's, oh dear, mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about it. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sort of... Uh, it's very sad. <laughs> I think what triggers people for films, though, can be very, very different because put Julie in front of Quentin Tarantino, which I have to watch through my fingers, and she doesn't have a problem. <laughs> but should you suggest something where an animal might kind of be placed in peril, even with a happy ending, I think that's that's where you draw the line, really, isn't it? Well, when, I, when I was a little girl, I only had to hear the music for Lassie. And the tears would come into my eyes, <laughs> you know, sort of like it was. It, they, I've always been a um, a real softy for for critters. But it, I seen for me it was Dad's Army because they were always. Re I know this is very like not contemporary, but it's there. They the way they treated Godfrey was horrible. Even as a six year old, I hated the fact that they could be mean to somebody because he was old. Um. And it really upset, you know, and I remember that now, you know, 50 years later. So we got the power of the soundtrack. We got the power of the characters. I mean, I must admit, that had never occurred to me that you could kind of identify with Godfrey. Now, was that because you were disabled? I don't, well, I don't know at that point. I mean, I, I'm going really back to kind of being six or seven or eight. Um, I mean, I was always a very aware of being different, you know, and I know because I went to a mainstream school. I mean, that's another whole other story about how I ended up in a mainstream school, which is utterly unheard of as a child with CP going into a mainstream school in 1967. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe it was that, that it was just that, you know, because you were, even, even as an infant, you're made to know quite how different you are when you are the only one that's different. Yeah, and I, I do think, it's probably completely naive of me, but I, I have a firm belief that, you know, children naturally have a sense of justice. And, you know, I think if, if you were outraged at how he was being treated, that was that was justifiable. I'm, I'm sorry for everyone under 49 who doesn't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Well, I don't know. They do show these programs over and over again. And again, that's the power of storytelling and a good story, isn't it? Yeah. 
Now for something completely different. <laughs> Well, not perhaps not that different. I haven't seen it the whole way through myself. Our associate drama company, Act Up Newham, have been working each week on Zoom and each week they create a production. Today's is a comedy about what happens when Zoom goes wrong. So we'll pop that on and then see, have a little chat about it and come back to filmmaking and storytelling. Are we ready to start? Yes. yes. Hello. No. Hello. No. 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 Are we ready for the first warm up? Yay! Yay! Okay, uh, hands up. Um, how are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I'm Yay! 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 Yes, yes, I forgot. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, Thanks. Oh, no. oh my god. We have to go. Oh, oh no. no. Bye. 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 Oh. I'm ready now. Where's, where's everybody?
That was great. That was marvellous. Yeah. Very <laughs> accurate as well. Well, I can't help thinking that reflected four months of rehearsals. <laughs> I just think it's incredible that they've managed to produce something every single week. And of course, we've quite often had separate films from Hannah and Sarah as well about their visual arts work. So, um, yeah, I thought that was terrific. We'd like to just tell you a little bit more about how you can join in from home with our programme. We have on our website, www.together2012.org.uk, a full range of activities and I'm going to just play you a short video. I think that's going to be easier than me explaining it and also I have a rather large cat bombarding me at the moment. <laughs> it might just give me an opportunity to get rid of it again. So um, this is our Join In From Home programme. Together, Together 2012 is running a Join In From Home programme from our website together2012.org.uk Click on the link at the top of the page, join in from home, to go straight to the main page where you have a wide range of accessible, inclusive, creative activities, mostly using things that you would already have at home. At the top of the page and throughout the pages, you will also see videos in British Sign Language to translate the site for deaf people. These videos can also be useful if you have difficulties reading and you simply want to hear more of the content. The Join In From Home programme is based on the activities that we would usually be running in East London. Dance Club usually meets on the fourth Monday of each month and they create improvised masked dance for the screen. Here you can also see their very first film where they simply made masks from paper plates, covered themselves with fabric and just moved gently to the music. You can hear as well there's an improvised soundtrack. So we're suggesting that you make a mask out of anything you can think of. It could be a cardboard box, a paper bag, a paper plate as in here. Video yourself dancing in it and then share the video with us. We will show it on screen and we will also enter it into the dance programme of our film festival, which we run every December. If you're temporarily or permanently chair-based, there's also a warm-up you can do here created by our associate wheelchair dance company, Folk in Motion. And that focuses on relaxing your upper body and improving your breathing. The Photographers and Filmmakers Club usually meets on the second Monday of each month. We're inviting you to make a video at home with the theme of home and share it with us. You can use a phone or a camera, make any kind of film you wish, including drama, documentary, dance, animation, artist films, comedy, and they'll be eligible for a cat award at our December Film Festival. You can also watch with us from home. In addition to Together 2012 TV with Together Unlocked and other live streams, we have the Together Disability Film Festival highlights. Each year we run the International Together Disability Film Festival in Stratford, bringing together a wide range of films by disabled filmmakers, as well as films about disability issues and disabled people. We always publish the programmes online with links to the films that are freely available. So we invite you to revisit our recent film festivals from the comfort of your own home and also to send us reviews of those films. And finally, you can sit back, relax and enjoy videos of past live performances, artist talks and creative workshops that we've produced in the past here. So, for example, from past festivals, we have documentation and films of creative dance workshops, street art performances, dances that the dance club have created, dance performances. And, of course, we're continuing to add new activities on a regular basis. 
So that's part of our Join In From Home programme. We'll tell you more about that on a Wednesday. As you can see, Mondays are very much film oriented and every film starts with a script. And I say that even if it's a very visual film, I think it still starts with a script. And that is my attempt to link this to writing. <laughs> and um, to invite Jamie Hale to join us to tell us about the writing course that they're running and we're just going to talk writing courses, Zooms, residential and online probably until four o'clock because it's a fascinating subject and we're really looking forward to seeing what Jamie has to say. I think you need to put your microphone on. Ah, hello. Hi. <laughs> Brilliant. Apologies, I hadn't realised. No, it's always better to do that than to have it the other way around. So without further ado, tell us about your project and your course. So Experimental was a wild idea that I pitched to spread the word a few months ago, that writing retreats were really inaccessible and why not run an online one for deaf and disabled writers? And then came a pandemic and everything going online. And so when I came, when I got an email from them, they said, you know, we we loved the idea at the time. How about going for it? And that's where it came from. And who has spread the word? Because I'm not familiar with them and it would be nice for other people to know as well. So they're a London based writing development agency um, that very much specialise in writers from marginalised backgrounds. So they run all sorts of programmes, including London Writers Awards which are a development programme um, which I took part in as a poet in the inaugural year, which was back in 2018. Um, so that's where my relationship with Spread the Word began. Um, they do they do loads of great stuff. Um, and so I very much felt like if I was going to find a mainstream organisation that was going to back this idea of mine, then it would be Spread the Word. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just wondering, Jamie, do you have the ability to turn your microphone down slightly? Don't worry if you don't. I don't, but I can try and speak a bit more quietly. <laughs> That's the kind of level of technology we're at. Uh, <laughs> viewers may know we use a platform called Be Live, and I'm certainly not complaining about it because it has its strengths, but we can't actually mix the sound between the three people who are coming into the studio. So, yes, just do bear with us. Jamie will speak a little less loudly, we'll speak up, and hopefully we will achieve some kind of balance. And miraculously, if you're watching the recording, of this later hopefully that will have been sorted out in the edit we post the recordings with the burned in captions by about eight o'clock each evening the captions can take a bit longer to load depending on how the internet's going but you can see all of the previous programs on our website under together unlocked tv and in a sub menu as they say we have our highlights and links page Everything that Jamie talks about now, including the agency, we will put the name and the link in, and that will be up by about six o'clock tonight. So anybody who wants further details, it's the highlights and links page under Together Unlocked TV. So when does this online course start, Jamie? Uh, it runs from the 31st of August for a week. And how does it operate? Tell us more about it. We'll uh, some questions. Well, my, my baseline was the fact that I've always wanted to do a residential writing retreat and it's just not been possible. And what I've liked about their concept is the immersiveness, the intensity, the community and the access to experts in the area of writing that you're studying. So. I wanted to figure out ways of recreating that from home, which meant a lot of back and forth consultation on Twitter with disabled people about structures and their accessibility, um, because everybody has very different access needs in terms of a structure. And for some people, having it spread out over too long a period was impossible, whereas for others, having too much each day was impossible. So I kind of settled for a model that involved one workshop and one kind of listening activity each day for six days um, 
my background is uh, poetry, essay, screenwriting. Um, I'm working on a couple of novels at the moment, but I wouldn't say fiction is my main area. Um, so it, there was a discussion with Spread the Word about whether we made it a genre-specific retreat or whether we did something more general. Um, and it seemed like the best model was to do two days on poetry, two days on fiction, and two days on kind of creative non-fiction and the personal essay um, in order to kind of reach out to as many writers as possible and to attempt a sort of space of cross-fertilisation where people who were more experienced in one area were able to develop their skills in another while supporting people with less experience when it came to their area. And I'm um, pleased to ask questions, everybody else. I know I'm hogging this at the moment. But how many spaces do you have on the course? We have 12, of which six are reserved for Londoners and six are open to writers across the UK. Um, spread the word is London-based and their funding is London-based, which is why we've set, up, set it up this way. And you have BSL interpretation available, as I understand it. Yeah, um, everything will be auto-captioned. We will have BSL interpretation. Um, where relevant, we will also have ASL interpretation um, because we've got at least one reader who will be using ASL for part of her reading. Um, we will be asking everybody to provide audio description for any images that come up on screen. Um, for ev following every hour of activity, there will be at least a half hour break um, and there will be a sort of five minute break in the hour, in the middle of the hour of activity to give people space to sort of grab a drink or go to the loo or whatever. Yes. I mean, it sounds really interesting. Um, what, what kind of output from the attendees are you hoping for, you know, on a, on a daily basis or at the end of the course or whatever? Do you have a sort of a level of expectation i mean like we run our um weekly poetry club um and i've done my own various writing courses and you know we kind of almost hothouse people into saying you've got half an hour to write a poem before you come back and tell us what you've written so do you have kind of expectations around that level um we don't have a kind of set we expect by the end you to have produced two personal essays a short story and six poems or anything like that um what we're doing is for each two days on the first day there will be a creating workshop mm -hmm. and a reading um and on the second day there will be a, a um master class and an industry workshop uh, or an industry industry talk so it's very much during the create workshop it is very much you have 10 minutes to go and write a 75 word piece of flash fiction. Um, it's very much designed to get people working in genres they're maybe not used to working in, to build their confidence a bit, um, and to get people trying things out. But we're not expecting people to produce kind of publishable output. It's a lot more about experimenting, hence the name. Um, it's an experiment for us in the way that we've set it up. It'll be an experiment for writers because not many writers are equally comfortable in fiction, creative nonfiction and poetry. So it's it's a space for people to to learn and broaden rather than a space for people to be expected to be producing expert output. OK, I mean, just in terms of, um, you know, from, from having run uh, maybe not residential workshops, but ones that people are coming to without staying over. So day, day you know, series of workshops, I suppose. Um, what one of the kind of exciting parts often of that is the kind of cross germination of ideas that people get in coffee breaks, lunch times, or just you know circle work. Are you going to be able to um, have any kind of non structured sessions where you can leave the Zoom or whatever platform you're using open so people can just talk with each other? Um, we're trying to create space in the create workshops for kind of checking in and conversation. Um, and there'll be a lot of, you know, go away, produce something, read it back. We'll discuss what we've all produced at the end. Um, in terms of creating more informal spaces, that's something that I'm keen to do, but haven't quite figured out 
how to structure amid the timetable access to interpreters. Um, I don't want a situation where the people that can skip a break to chat get to chat, whereas yeah, the people yeah. that can't skip a break are forced to miss out on opportunities. So that's something that I need to figure out how to build in, especially when Zoom is such an artificial platform for conversation. I think that'll probably come more from encouraging and creating conversation within workshops um, from the use of things like breakout rooms for small group work, etc., than it will from here is an empty Zoom room, now talk. Yeah, cool, cool. Do you want to ask anything, Julie? Have you got workshop leaders? We have, yes. Um, we've now got all of the, we've got the three masterclass leaders um, and the three readers lined up. Um, so the master, the, for poetry, the masterclass will be done by Raymond Antrobus, um, who wrote a collection called The Perseverance, um, which won, which was very successful um, and won major awards. Um, and then for reading, we'll have um, Kairani Baraka, um, who um, co-edited the anthology Stairs and Whispers, which is an anthology of deaf and disabled poetry um, for um, fiction. We'll have um, a masterclass led by the author Anne Finger, um, who is an American author um, who's written both in personal essay and in fiction um, and whose work I always find really fresh and exciting. Um, she's an experienced creative writing tutor um, and for the reading we'll have, I'm embarrassed to say I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her surname, um, but Sarah Novick, um, who is a deaf author of um, short stories primarily, I believe, uh, novels. Um, she wrote a successful book called Girl at War. Um, I was really delighted to be able to get her. Um, and then for uh, the personal essay, we'll have a masterclass by Elsa Sjernison, um and a, a reading by Kayla Whaley. Um, so we've got a really broad range of, of writers um, writing across um, across the world, really, um, rather than rather than just reaching out to to UK based people, because I was really keen that while uh, this series of workshops is um, is funded within the UK, that it would be really great if this could go out into being a far more worldwide experience in future. Yes, and we always say as a disabled people's movement and indeed as an international art movement, you know, we're international movements and always have been. So I think that's really exciting. I went to Survivors Poetry online last week and there was two poets there from the States. There was somebody there from Seville. They were talking about doing a trip to a Berlin based club, to a San Francisco based club. And you just think, you know, it's the power of Zoom when the rest of the world, instead of saying, oh, no, do I can't possibly have a video call or a video meeting. You're going to have to come in even if you can't get transport. They've suddenly worked out that like the rest of us with gremlins permitting it is possible to do these things. I had a scholarship to do. I've only ever done one residential writing course and it must have been at least 15 years ago. And that was at the John Osborne Centre. And I I would imagine that all of those things are completely closed at the moment. But I did find it, for all the reasons that you were saying, a challenging experience. I had to get permission for Julie to come because I couldn't get a PA to drive me and take a sort of long weekend out. And I couldn't get there on my own. The um, the so-called disabled access is never as good as other people think it is. And you never really realise that until you're the only wheelchair user stuck somewhere. And... Um, and I didn't find it the most sociable thing in the world because everybody sat around a big, big table, but the wheelchair users, or us, could only access the far end of the table. And people don't, I don't know what you find, guys, but I find that people don't tend to come to you. If you can't get to them and they don't know who you are and you're sitting in a wheelchair, it's just another useful way of not striking up that kind of conversation. So I enjoyed it. It was sociable, but physically, 
it was very demanding and like you say the hours were really draining and yeah this just sounds absolutely brilliant so it's 12 places for people in london you've got this wonderful group of people teaching it how are you going to select people how do they apply so application is um via spread the words website um and people are asked to produce um two samples of work uh where a sample i believe is either two poems or 500 words of fiction or 500 words of creative non-fiction um and people can produce their two samples in the same genre or in different genres um and we're going to work we're going to work from the applications we're looking for people who are kind of actively creating experimenting trying new things in their work um we haven't limited it to people without a published book um we're keen to find people who are emerging but we realize that emerging looks like lots of different things and lots of different experiences so we don't want to put kind of artificial limits on that we want to take each application as it comes and are you aiming for balance around things like gender and other protected characteristics are you taking those kind of things into account in terms of having a balanced group is it all going to be about the writing um i mean one of spread the words big commitments is making sure that diverse spaces are created and maintained um and that's something that i think is really important with this with this workshop series as well um so i'm really i'm i'm really keen to make sure that we're selecting a group of group of writers who are I'm not going to say balanced because I don't think we should necessarily be aiming for balance so much as that we should be aiming to open up spaces more broadly than that um I don't want to say um as as a trans person that we have two reserved spaces for trans people and then we have five great trans applicants and we're like well we're going to pick two of you because we've got two trans spaces um we want to make sure that voices that aren't normally heard in these rooms are heard here and so that that doesn't necessarily mean aiming for balance so much as aiming for something better than that and i think that's very reassuring for people who are applying and in terms of you said you weren't looking at limiting it to people who hadn't published but are you open to pretty much absolute beginners what sort of experience are you hoping for um, we're hoping for people who are actively engaged in their writing um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they've ever had anything published it doesn't necessarily mean anything more than that it but it does mean that we're looking for people who are actively working not people who've never tried it before yes that makes perfect sense I mentioned our year-round clubs program earlier and right at the beginning of that, we knew that there were lots of disabled people who, before other groups had been cut in any case, you know, used to come together every single week to make art. And we said, if you work at your art every week and you take it seriously, as far as we're concerned, you're an artist. And I think that's absolutely right about writing. You know, if you take your writing seriously and you write a lot, then do think about showing it to us publishing it online think about these courses but if you're writing every week and you're taking it seriously you are a writer you don't need anybody else to give you permission to call yourself a writer or to write you know think about applying josh you came into lockdown very much with a scientists and athletes identity where you've been discovering your creative side um but my guess is that residential and digital alternatives to writing courses are quite new to you what's your take on it what did you want to ask um well they, they in terms of the residential side of it that they are um but in terms of kind of writing sessions um at, at the university we have a an office of PhD students um, that we all kind of sit together um, and sometimes it's nice to just have someone in the same room because it means that you can't just watch Netflix all day um, or, or if you've got a question but the university runs I think they're every two weeks or they, they were and I think they're running them um, online now and um, their sessions called shut up and write and um, 
which basically kind of for, for PhD students or kind of staff that are writing up various books or articles or, or whatever, um, that you can go and they kind of give you coffee and cake. Um, and it's kind of an hour, two hours where you just sit down together and, and kind of put pen, put pen to paper. Um, and it's, it's less of a kind of guided tutorial thing um, in terms of what Jamie was talking about, but it's more of a productive peer pressure, I guess, that, that you're kind of like Robin was saying about kind of hot housing and kind of like the poetry club, that you're, you're in a group of people that you all, you know, you're there to write something, w whatever it is, you're there to write something. Um, and I think those, I, mean, I haven't kind of been to one of those sessions, but I have been due to go to the office. Um, and sometimes it, it's really good just to kind of have, you know, someone just to bounce an idea off of, or you know, for me, writing kind of academically, but it, it worked for anything. You know, you write something and you go, does that make sense? Or does this line work or, or whatever? And rather than spend 45 minutes with the sort, you know, you can just go, oh, read this, right? you know, re read this paragraph. It's like, oh, yeah, no, that, that sounds really good. Or have you tried this? Um, so I think kind of the idea of a, a, a residential, whether that's virtual or not, it just sounds like a really cool idea. Um, I think one of the things I was interested in, I was looking at the website earlier, um, was creative nonfiction. Um, and this may be my non-artist side showing. Is that kind of like biography type writing? And what is creative nonfiction? Because <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, I'd say it's a really it's a really broad category. Um, and I initially made it broad because I wasn't sure um, exactly where we were going to put the focus. So ultimately, we've put the focus on, on the personal essay. Um, and I mean, that's something that I've actually read some brilliant personal essays by scientists in particular, um, because it's very much as a structure, it goes beyond writing about your own experience to contextualize that. Um, there's a lot of very good ones on the Welcome Collections website um, that often come from a science background. Um, I'm currently writing a series for them called Art, Access and Activism, um, which puts kind of my work in co in context with other people's um so i've looked at for example eye gaze artists um a blind circus artist um a visually impaired landscape painter um i've got ones coming out on a deaf director and a deaf hip-hop artist um and um in all of them i'm kind of looking at my art slightly in the context of their work Okay. Um, but the um, I've also written for them um, in the past on on other issues on the experiences of being a disabled person in hospital, and there's some wonderful stuff on there um, that looks at kind of science history or whatever in the context of experience of having a specific condition. Um, so the personal essay is very much. This, this space in which you're contextualizing your experience in something broader. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd I, been, oh, I think Josh, sorry. I think what Josh was just prodding it was how do you define creative nonfiction? I mean, is it everything that isn't, for example, a straight news report or kind of dry as bones? Anybody? Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I think kind of what you're saying around like the personal essay stuff. It, yeah, it, it's kind of those, it, it's almost, it, it's not a news story, but it, it, it's a, it's a story of your life and, and, and experiences, which makes sense, I suppose. It, it, yeah. it is a story of nonfiction, which is kind of self-explanatory when I think about it, I guess, but um, no, it just sounds... Yeah, so I mean, I'm still sort of slightly on a, I've been slightly sidetracked by um, Welcome because my the book that I mentioned earlier, Abnormal, and the exhibition that went with it, that was funded by Welcome Trust during a residency at the National Institute of Medical Research. And I was just thinking how much that changed because I remember getting that funding around 2007. 
And what they used to fund was disabled artists to write about disabled people or to work with disabled people. And myself and I think Catherine Marinello, we were the start of a kind of now a real wave of them funding disabled people to write about a lived experience and accepting that you can't situate that experience in somebody else's kind of understanding of the world, if that makes any sense at all. Julie, you haven't said much at all, and we're coming up to the last few minutes of the show. Why don't we give you the final words? Eek. <laughs> um, Jamie, that's, uh, it's really nice to, to see you and have you come onto the show and tell us about your your residential coming up and how to apply. And I think that's that's really inspiring as well because we need to be able to create new ways of, uh, of, of doing things which traditionally have been very inaccessible. I think you're absolutely spot on. And I could recognise what you were saying about difficulties in accessing residential courses. So, you know, I wish you every success in it. I think it's very exciting to have it there. And I'm hoping that this will be the first of many. Yes, that is absolutely right. And um, yes, please do come and talk to us about supporting one in the future. So Wednesday is our pop-up poetry day. It's when our real-life pop-up poetry club now meet for the about the third week running yeah, by the really telephone. Great. Most of them don't have internet access, so we haven't been able to run that group as a Zoom. And for obvious reasons, things like drawing and painting sessions don't do too well on Zoom, even if people had access. But the pop-up poetry club is going strong. Julie will be there on Wednesday morning. So on Wednesday afternoon, we will have more poems from the pop-up poetry Great. club to share with you, as well as poems by other people. Our challenge on the Join In From Home programme is to write a poem on the theme of Together. We will then be publishing an anthology of those poems in November as part of our Disability History Month Festival. So please do send us in your poems on the theme of Together and we'll have to ask Jamie to spread the word. Jamie, we must invite you back on in September to tell us all about how it goes. I mean... I suppose you're too busy, unfortunately, to apply for it. But I was just thinking when the people were talking about having that focus on the work, that that's what we do in the Poetry Club, for better or for worse. People have got 20 minutes, half an hour to just write. And you've started writing as a result, haven't you? I mean, have you found that helpful? Um, not really. I, I, it's... <laughs> so you've been writing, Julie. I've been you writing, don't yes. usually. I, I, I don't usually write... Um as part of the poetry group but i thought it was only fair um to be participating more actively um as i was you know sort of part of the part of the group i thought yeah absolutely let, there's nothing to lose i've been writing poetry since i was about 8 so you know it's sort of not that new to me but it is it is new to me to to write in a group and i think that's where the residential aspect of it is quite interesting jamie because it's a very different experience than sort of being an isolated uh, poet or writer or, you know, whatever, um, you know, to actually do something in a group collectively. I think that's quite inspiring. Yes, I mean, I was talking at Survivor's Poetry on Thursday about how we don't really call ourselves poets. It's very difficult to call yourself a poet and to sort of legitimate calling yourself a poet and in fact as far as I've got is outspoken word artist I still <laughs> a poet. so yes I mean I think that being part of a group really allows you to kind of yes reinforce each other and create that safer space and I think that's the key for any of these residentials or indeed virtuals as we shall learn to call them is that safer space which means that you do feel you can experiment and you can write and you can dare to speak it out loud and let other people listen to it without cutting your head off so this has just been absolutely fascinating all of the detail will be on our sites and links page we will be talking to Jamie again. If you need any information you can't get from the highlights and links page, or for some reason you've got access to email but not the internet at large, drop us a line to tv at together2012.org.uk and we will pass your message on or do our best to answer your question. Please also send in your poems, your films, your artwork. There's a whole range 
active activities on the Join In From Home website, but we'd love to see your work just about of just about any subject, really. So we'll say goodbye from London. Thank you for coming along, everybody. And goodbye to Jamie. And final word to the West Midlands. Hey, it's goodbye from us. and look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday. Yeah, cheers, Jamie. Thanks for coming on. And I'll see you Wednesday. Bye.